back when we planned this, there was a faint hope to have this as an on-site event, um, but unfortunately, this did not play out. So we're gathering here once again um, in this virtual form, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome today's guest um, straight from space, Tobias Ruprecht um, from the Free University of Berlin. Um, he's a um, what's the exact term again? Junior group leader or something of um, uh, of the research cluster um, or the research group peripheral liberalism, liberalism within the research cluster of excellence scripts, contestations of the liberal script. Um, I guess Tobias will uh, say a few words about this um, during his talk. Um, Tobias, um, before coming to Berlin, Tobias was uh, at the University of Exeter, so at another hotbed of um, transformation slash late socialism research. Um, the two of us actually go way back um, to the university, European University Institute in Florence and the University of Tübingen, where it all began. So we're, we're talking 20 years here, um, which kind of means we've grown old, but uh, not too old to do some interesting research. Um, and uh, Tobias is going to introduce us to um, his current work um, within this uh, topic of peripheral liberalism, economists and globalization um, in the transformation of Russia, 1970 to 2000. Um, I hope all of you or most of you have had the chance to also read his paper, The Road from Snake Hill, The Genesis of Russian Neoliberalism, which um, we're going to discuss today. So without further ado, Tobias, um, the floor is yours for the next, um, what did we agree on, 25 to 30 minutes, and then um, we'll grill you a little bit. So um, please, Tobias, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, Janis. Um, peripheral liberalism is a tongue twister indeed, isn't it? I occasionally struggle myself. <laughs> um, I was very much looking forward to this talk. This is one of the first opportunities to present research that I've been doing recently on a generation of Soviet slash Russian liberal economists. And I'm interested in the sort of intellectual genesis, or the, the formation of a by a large coherent group and in their attempts to influence economic policy making in Russia in the 1990s. So these people I'm interested in are those who in the 1990s oversaw the economic reforms in post-Soviet Russia as economic advisors to Yeltsin, as ministers of the economy, ministers of finance, of foreign trade and the like. So you will probably be familiar with some of them, such as uh, Yegor Gaidar or Anatoly Chubais. Others are less known, especially outside of Russia. And I'm particularly interested in their formation before they became influential figures. And uh, you mentioned this already in your kind introduction, Yanis. Uh, I don't do this research on my own. This is part of a research group, a smaller group called Peripheral Liberalism that I lead at Freie Universität in Berlin. And, and this in turn is part of, of, of a larger uh, um, cluster, a uh, cluster of excellence, as these are called, um, which deals with contestations of the liberal script. This is mostly social science approaches to explain the rise and popularity of populist movements and parties. Um, we are kind of the token historians in a larger project, which is mostly um, social sciences. Um, I would like to show the next slide, but this is not working. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. What we do mostly in the, in this, in the smaller group of, of historians is look at the intellectual genesis of liberal economists in late state socialism, that is in Eastern Europe, in the Soviet Union, and in China. And we are especially interested in intellectual exchange within the socialist world, 
So you have one project, for example, on exchange between Hungary and China, economic or exchange of economic ideas between these uh, these two countries. We have a project on Estonian neoliberal economists and their connections to Hungary and Georgia. And there's my project on the Soviet slash Russian neoliberals. We're hoping to expand this a bit and also include other non-European socialist countries. So hopefully we'll soon also have a project on Chile, for example. Now I should probably explain why we chose this term peripheral liberalism, even though it's so difficult to pronounce. And occasionally this, this kind of raises eyebrows with people who are a bit wary of uh, Eurocentrism. So let me briefly explain what we mean by this uh, peripheral liberalism. There are two meanings of peripheral in this force, in this, uh, in, this, in this term. The one refers to the self-perception of our actors. So this is a term that we find a lot in our sources when these people think about the position of their own countries in the world economy. So what we see is that starting in the 1970s, some economists start losing their hope in socialist economics as a way of overcoming the peripheral status of their countries in the world economy and they start thinking about other ways in which they could overcome their peripheral status so it's, it's a term that is used by the actors themselves but we also use it in, in the sense of the position of these economists in the local context and we say that these are actually also quite peripheral figures in their local intellectual and political context. So they're often on the margins of intellectual debates and their political influence is often very limited. So it's kind of a double meaning of this uh, peripheral. And if you had a chance to look at the paper that I had, Yanni circulated, and um, you will have noticed that I don't use this term peripheral liberalism in the paper, but I speak of neoliberalism. Um, first, I do this because this is a, this is going to become a contribution to a collected volume on non-Western forms of neoliberalism. And second, I think the case can be made that if defined properly, properly then this term neoliberalism really also applies to the, to the kinds of figures that we, that we look at. Okay, there's a widespread notion of the enormous and lasting influence of so-called neoliberals on the course of globalization since the 1970s and particularly on the transformation of the socialist world since 1989. To some extent, this idea, or at least the popularity of this idea, goes back to two enormously influential books that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. These books are Joseph Stiglitz, Globalization and its Discontents, and Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine. So for everyone who was politically socialized in the 1990s and the 2000s, these were extremely influential books. These were widely read and widely discussed. And the narrative that they present is one of neoliberal globalization as a sort of Western neo-colonialism after the end of the Cold War. In Stiglitz's book, it's uh, largely advices from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, that spread these ideas from the West to transforming countries. And in Naomi Klein's book, it is uh, largely a history of the um, uh, evil doings of the Chicago school economist Milton Friedman around the world. Both of these books have um, entire chapters on the Russian transitions. And the story here is, again, neoliberal advices from the West and some local ideological converts impose a type of economy on Russia that is alien to its culture, that is unnecessarily radical, and thus destroys the Soviet economy and plunges Russia into poverty, cross inequality, deindustrialization, and political instability. It's a bit ironic that this uh, reproach of ignorance of the advisors, um, which you find not only in these books, but in a lot of uh, similar accounts, well, you could kind of apply this reproach also to the authors themselves. So neither Stiglitz nor Klein are known for particular expertise on Russia. And you could also say, well, these are not strictly academic books. So why do I present them? Why do I talk about them here? Yeah. And um, but I think they are important because they were so influential, because they really established a certain way of thinking about transformation of socialist countries. And not only in, in a wider public, but, but also in academia. So I, I still see them um, referenced a lot actually in academic texts also in books by authors from Eastern Europe and Russia. And I find it, I find it quite interesting where 
Stiglitz and Klein get their information from, not being experts on Russia themselves. So Stiglitz gets a lot of his, um, um, his story from his experience as the chief economist of the World Bank. So it seems there's a bit of an institutional competition here between the IMF and the World Bank. And his story on Russia is largely based on interviews with the Soviet economist or Russian economist, Alek Bagamolov. Alek Bagamolov was one of the key advisors of Gorbachev and one advisor who, an advisor who always recommended Gorbachev follow the Chinese path of reforms in the late 1980s. Naomi Klein does not use any primary source material at all, and her account is based largely, or I think it's fair to say exclusively, on these two books you see on the left here, and left in the center. The one is uh, Boris Kagalitsky's Russia under Yeltsin and Putin, and Peter Redaway's Tragedy of Russia's Reforms, Market Bolshevism Against Democracy. If you're not familiar with these authors, very briefly, they are both leftist authors who were involved in the activities of the left dissident in the late Soviet Union. Kagalitsky himself as, as a Soviet dissident, a neo-Marxist, and Peter Redway, a British-American author who was very close to um, a kind of the kind of human rights dissidents in the late Soviet Union who stood for ideas of convergence. So ideas that in the long run the West would become more socialist and the Soviet Union would become more democratic and it would meet somehow in the middle, which is not exactly what happened uh, in the transformation period. So what we have is kind of the, the narratives of the losers of a political struggle in the 1980s. So it's not always the winners who write history in this case, it's actually the, uh, the losers who created very powerful narratives about the transformation. There's another book I put on this slide because it also had an enormous impact on this notion that it was IMF advisors who controlled or imposed the kinds of transition that Russia eventually underwent. This is uh, Janine Weder's Collision and Collusion, based exclusively on interviews with IMF advisors who went to Eastern Europe in the 1990s. And a lot of these advisors uh, afterwards, after the publication, actually complained that their views were presented in a very distorted way in the book. So our own approach differs from this one here, from the approaches of, of these, these authors here, in the kinds of um, sources we use. So we look at the actors themselves. So we look at the sources produced by the figures themselves, their own writings, their speeches at conferences, their memoirs, um, and we want to get a better sense of the origins of their economic ideas and worldviews and their political activities based on the evidence that they produce themselves. And in this talk today, I thought I'd boil this down to three arguments. And these three arguments that I want to convince you of are first, the ideational shift among Soviet economists towards efficiency, markets, competition, and labor discipline is something that happened already starting from the early 1970s. Second argument, I think it's more helpful to think about this process as a process of globalization and not a process of westernization. The Soviet economists that we're looking at, or overall the economists in the socialist world that we look at, engage intellectually with their own economies. They engage with the reform experience in other socialist countries. And they had, they came up with interpretations of global developments, in, in, especially in developing uh, third world countries which had an impact on their own economic thought or their thought on political economy to be pre precise. Third argument is I think there was a limited influence on political decision making in the 1990s so these were not all powerful Bolsheviks as in Vodovay's subtitle I think this um, this notion this comparison with the Bolsheviks which is very popular you constantly read this in a and in the literature, but I think this is misleading and overstates the influence that these people actually have. First argument. The idea, ideational shift among Soviet economists towards efficiency, markets, competition, and labor discipline happens as early as the 1970s. 
almost all leading economists of the Yeltsin era had their professional intellectual roots in Soviet mathematical economics. And almost all of them were affiliated or in touch with this institute that you see in the picture here on my slide. This is the so-called CME, the Central Mathem Economic Mathematical Institute of the Soviet Academy of Science, or today Russian Academy of Science in Norway, Cheryomoshki. So if you happen to know where the German Historical Institute in Moscow used to be, just right there around the corner. This is a creation of the 1960s in the spirit of the thaw, and it meant to revive the academic study of economics after Stalinism. So in the 1960s, the Academy of Science gathered the survivors of Stalinist mass murder, um, a large number of uh, Soviet economists, either migrated in the 1920s or were then killed in the, um, in the um, purges or the mass murders of the 1930s to the 1950s. In the 60s, the Academy provided excellent working conditions for these surviving economists and for a new generation of economists at newly created institutions, not only in Moscow, but also in Leningrad, Novosibirsk and Tallinn. And a key figure in the rebirth of mathematical economics, economics was Leonid Kantarovich, who would in the mid 1970s win the Nobel Prize in economics, no less. So what did these mathematical economists do and why is it relevant? Based on Kantarovich, Kantarovich's ideas of so-called linear programming, they sought to optimize the planned economy. And these were very elaborate mathematical models for the optimal, most efficient use of goods and resources. It gets, it gets a little bit complicated now. Please bear with me. These mathematical models needed precise information about the value of resources and goods that were produced in the Soviet economy. So they had these very elaborate, complicated mathematical equations for optimal resource distribution, but it needed data to fill in the variables in these equations. And the problem was, this was a command economy with centrally administered prices. So prices did not reflect the value of goods, but they reflected political preferences. So in order to be able to optimize the planned economy, some of these mathematical economists, um, as early as 1970, start lobbying for a deregulation of prices. No IMF advisors uh, involved here, I can assure you. At the same time, these small elite academic circles were relatively well connected with colleagues abroad, including in the West. They read some Western literature and they sometimes met personally at conferences and invited talks. And during the taunt, an institution was created for East-West intellectual exchange as it happens near Vienna in Luxembourg. Luxembourg. So that's but what was, what was happening there was not so much a Western infiltration of the East with ideas on unfettered capitalism and the like, but it was a rather level-headed exchange in both directions, really. And also we have to keep in mind that this is the 1970s, so the dominating ideas in Western social science and economics um, at the time were not um, deregulated neoliberal capitalism, but ideas on optimization and planning were widespread in the West as well. Very popular were system analysis and cybernetics. So thinking about social systems as self-regulating systems. And the cybernetics had its roots in the optimization of military gear, but then these, these, these models and these mathematical equations were also widely used um, beyond the military and applied to thinking about society and economics as a whole. So from this, this idea of uh, or this concept or these models of linear pro programming, Soviet economists took the idea that prices should be deregulated. And from their thinking about system analysis and cybernetics, they got ideas about the economy as a self-regulating rather than centrally controlled system. So I see here the first roots of Russian neoliberalism. It's only the roots so far, but I think these have become important ideas later. Now, all attempts to sell these ideas of optimized planning to politics in the 1970s failed. 
the war completely futile. Soviet political leaders don't consider for a moment to give up price controls because control over prices means political control. And all reform drives that existed in the Soviet economy in the 1960s were basically given up in the 1970s for a number of reasons. Uh, amongst them, uh, importantly, and very high petrol prices. So the Soviet Union was exporting oil, oil prices were high, they were uh, spawned with oil money, there was not really a on the surface, at least, no pressure to reform. So these semi-economists, these mathematical economists, they are occasionally reprimanded um, for their division from Communist Party principles from the late 70s. And now they just focus on their mathematical equations and they keep quiet about political reforms, at least on the surface. Below the surface, some semi-economists join the dissident movement. They publish journals in some is that, and now they demand not only the deregulation of prices, but also the end of one party rule and a liberal democratic system. But this is only a tiny, tiny minority of what is already a tiny minority um, in Soviet academia. And also the, these very few people who go this path of uh, dissidents, uh, they all end up in jail in the 1980s, in the early 1980s under Andropov. Equally below the surface, but eventually to much greater effect, a younger generation of economists in the 1980s begins questioning some of the tenets of their teacher's generation. They maintain the notions of price deregulation and of the economy as a self-regulating system, but they discard them from any lingering notions of socialist romanticism and the optimization of planning. And the reason still has nothing to do, the reason for this change of mind still has nothing to do with the IMF or Milton Friedman, the reason why they develop so fundamental doubts about the planned economy is the life experience of the Soviet economy in action. They have access to data from their relatively privileged positions. They have daily interaction with the administration of the Soviet economy. And from the 1980s, they undertake several sociological and anthropological studies of the Soviet Union. So they go, for example, to the Altai to study the uh, Soviet agriculture and the interaction of local bureaucrats with the central planning bureaucrats. And the conclusion that they take from these, uh, from these studies is that the planned economy and that the Soviet Union basically is no longer a planned economy. The Soviet economy, according to these, these conclusions that these, uh, these people draw in the early 80s, only works because it's based on a bureaucratic market. What is a bureaucratic market? It's the negotiation of local administrators and, and uh, factory directors um, who in fact already own the means of conduct production because they control them. And the whole system only works with based on this highly corrupt and ridiculously inefficient system of bargaining. So it's the theory of the bureaucratic market which this um, younger generation develops in the 1980s. And so as early as the early 1980s, some of these mathematical economists, especially of the younger generation, already say that the only chance to break the power of these bureaucrats is the immediate and vertical privatization of the entire Soviet industry. And they write about this in some of the publications, they discuss this, and still um, no connection to the IMF whatsoever. A quick note on what I call here on the slide socialist authoritarian monetarism. This is not a term that they use themselves, but I think this is a term that can be applied as an analytical term to some of their thinking in the 1980s. Because, as I said, some a tiny minority went into full dissidence, but the majority actually kind of arranged themselves with the political system as it existed. But they start thinking about how to get this existing political system to and deregulate the economy according to their ideas. And the ideas are very much based on financial reform and getting more labor discipline, for example, by creating competitive uh, salaries or by um, creating fiscal, fiscal austerity um, to make the, the companies more efficient. So they, they think a lot about how to use financial means to get the economy more efficient without touching the political system. 
So to sum up, I see there's I see a, a generational conflict in Soviet mathematical economics in the 1980s, and this can be roughly divided into two groups, two generations. The, the younger, the, the older generation, um, very much shaped, influenced by the ideas of the 1960s, these uh, ideas of reviving the socialist project and with optimization and also elements of, of, uh, of democracy. And it's these older, it's this older generation of economists who become advisors to Gorbachev when he starts his perestroika in 1985. And two of the most important economic advisors to Gorbachev are Agan Begian and Bagamolov, whom I mentioned earlier. And uh, and this, uh, this generation really has the most influence on Gorbachev's economic thinking and then the, on the way in which perestroika was um, uh, was done when it came to, to the economy. There's a kind of a, a transitional group, um, I would say they're of the same age as, um, as the, the 60s, they're part of the 60s generation, but they already have more radical notions of reform. A couple of names um, are um, especially important, Petrakov, Yasin, and Shmelyov, really. Petrakov is the one who already in 1970 suggests the deregulation of prices, for example. And they try to get access to, to Gorbachev. Gorbachev listens to them, but he does not heed their advice. So their influence is very much limited. And, and then there's the, the, the younger generation, and this is the generation I'm, I'm mostly interested in, really. The generation of the, who then in the 90s become the young reformers. And these are people like uh, Larissa Piyasheva, Yegor Gaidar, Anatoly Chubais, Vitaly Naishul, Alfred Koch, uh, Alexei Kudrin is probably uh, someone you are familiar with, who was the Russian finance minister until 10 years ago. And, um, and this generation in the 1980s is still too young to have any influence on, on reforms. And they become extremely critical of, of, of perestroika. Some, some of them still support perestroika in the beginning, but they uh, some of them say from the beginning, this is, this is not what is going to save the Soviet economy. And so they become very critical of, of Gorbachev by the late 1980s. They get together in groups and discuss uh, different uh, ways out of the economic crisis. And then in 19, 1991, during the political conflict between Gorbachev and Yeltsin, this group in its entirety uh, goes over into the Yeltsin camp. And when Yeltsin prevails in this, in this, in this conflict with uh, Gorbachev, the Soviet Union disintegrates, Yeltsin becomes president. Uh, these people then become his economic advisors and his, his ministers at a very young age. They're all in the, in the early 30s. Now, quick excursus on neoliberalism. Why do I think it's fair to call this uh, younger generation, those of the 1970s, this Gaidan Chubais generation, and uh, neoliberals. There's um, many different definitions you hear of this term neoliberalism, and usually it's, it's used in a kind of a, a negative term for deregulated capitalism or the like, but this is not, not what I mean. I think what defines neoliberalism is uh, these, uh, these uh, three char characteristics here. Neoliberals think that modern national economies are too complex to be centrally controlled. And they are really, really serious about the necessity of free prices because they see this as needed for the creation of knowledge in a complex national economy. This is one. The second uh, key char characteristic of neoliberalism is that central economic control is seen as a political tool. This is very obvious from you know, Hayek's writing. This is basically what he says in his Road to Serfdom. And the third characteristic of neoliberalism as opposed to classical liberalism is this notion that markets are not naturally given, but that markets are a cultural or political creation. And following up on this, they develop ideas on a strong state that is needed to defend markets, to create markets and to defend markets if need be from interest groups, and uh, this also occasionally includes the defense of markets from democratic access. So these definitions here did apply very well to the kind of neoliberalism that was developed in the interwar period in Central Europe. And 
people like Hayek and, and came up with these, uh, these ideas uh, in the 30s and 40s. And I think something very similar is happening in the Soviet Union in Soviet mathematical economics in the 1980s. And it's happening before these people start reading Hayek, actually. So in a way, you could say they develop Hayekian ideas in the 1980s in the Soviet Union before they start reading and seriously engaging with um, Hayek. I come to the second argument, and I'll be a bit uh, briefer here. The second argument is that I think it makes more sense to think of the development of the economic thinking of these people in the context of globalization, not westernization, because they were intellectually engaging not only with the West, but especially with impressions from the Soviet economy, with reform experience in the socialist world, and with interpretations of global developments in the 1980s. And this sort of transition from the, the generation of the 60s to the generation of the 1970s can be clearly seen in these, uh, in these three examples. The 60s still took the inspiration from market socialism of the, uh, the Soviet kind, new economic policy of the 20s, the Hungarian model, the Chinese model. And the 1970s, the younger generation still deals with these models, but comes to consciously reject these. So they still think about the Hungarian model, for example, but they come to reject it because they, they say, well, it may be better than ours, but they're to their throats in debt. This is not what we, what we, what we should do here. Or they reject the U Yugoslav model because they find out that this actually creates higher unemployment rates, for example. And they reject the Chinese model first uh, in the mid 80s because they don't know much about China, really. And then after 1989, they reject the Chinese model because they see the Chinese model as a way in which the Communist Party preserves its, its power. And this is not something that they want at home in the Soviet Union. Similar shift from the 60s, 60s to the 70s uh, in the perception of the third world, the 60s and had kind of this, uh, this attitude of socialist paternalism of uh, third world countries. There were contexts were built up in the, in the context of socialist internationalism and the 70s building on these, on these contexts to the third world then develop an admiration for development dictatorships as models of transition that they can emulate in the Soviet Union. Because the thing is, the West was interesting as a goal, but the West did not provide a transition model. Other countries, Chile, for example, which I've studied a lot over the past years, provided a model of authoritarian transition. And, and of course, did, did, did these people also look to the West, but the West was not always seen as only a, a positive model, but you can clearly see that the way in which these uh, 70th generation discusses the West uh, also always includes a conscious rejection of social democracy, which they see as uh, less economic efficient than the deregulated de capitalism that they see in, um, in Chile, for example, or uh, in the UK under Thatcher. Final argument. There was a limited influence on political decision making that these neoliberals eventually had in the 1990s and 2000s. Yes, they did become advisors and um, yes, they did become ministers. But I think a couple of assumptions that you quite often read in the literature of the Stiglitz Klein type, but also in kind of Foucauldian inspired stories of neoliberalism, and they tend to neglect certain basic. I would call this facts, or perhaps just my interpretation of the facts um, concerning the chronology and the power dynamics of this, of this transition. So I think it's important to keep in mind that it was not the neoliberals in the Soviet case who destroyed the Soviet economy, um, but first did the Soviet economy and the Soviet state collapse, and then did the liberal reforms begin in 1992. And as I hopefully, um, made the case for convincingly today, a lot of the, the concepts called the neoliberal, if you, if you like, for, for the transition were already developed in the 1970s and 1980s before these people connected to global networks and international organizations, which happens in 1988, 1989. But these basic ideas 
ideas on privatization, ideas on the market, ideas on price creation, they were all already there in the Soviet Union, in these small circles, but nonetheless, these circles then become influential in the 90s. They become influential, but there are limits to their power. They're always just advisors to the president without their own political legitimacy. So the power does not come from them or their ideas, the power comes from the political executive and Yeltsin hires these people when it's convenient for him and his political strategies and he immediately fires them um, when it serves his political purposes and there's nothing that the liberals can do about this. So they have no own power basis, they always depend on the goodwill of um, Yeltsin. And also I would say that in the economic transition, they had more of a reactive role and were not the driving influence on the transition. And privatization, for example, was a process that kind of followed from the collapse of the Soviet state. And what was happened essentially was a, a mass robbery of the state property by precisely those bureaucrats that they, that they were so critical of. And everything they tried with their economic policies in the 1990s is kind of trying to install some power of the Russian state to, to get control over this process of uh, nomenclatura and privatization, which was more of a, a bank run really. And these uh, neoliberals really strive for a stronger state, which is also the reason why I think it's fair to call them neoliberals, uh, rather than for a laissez-faire kind of uh, economic system. And all this fascination for you know, dictatorial transition of authoritarian capitalism of the Chilean kind is very much to do with their desire to have more state capacity to get more control over this process of transition. So I think this idea that they just thought we let it go and everything will just uh, arrange itself is is not uh, it's not quite what these these people were thinking and doing at the time. Okay, quick recap, and then I finish. I suggest three arguments. I hope we get into a discussion about this. Uh, first argument was the ide ideational shift among Soviet economists towards efficiency markets, competition, and so forth is, a, is a, something that already is clearly discernible in the 1970s. It's, a, it's part of a process of globalization rather than westernization. And I think we should always consider the limited influence. Of course, that influence, but there was limits to the influence of the Russian neoliberals on political decision making in the 1990s. And this also applies to the 2000s. So occasionally you, you hear and read about the Putin system as kind of a continu continuation of the neoliberal system um, because, because Putin is authoritarian, because Putin is uh, fiscally conservative, because it is a form of capitalism, obviously. But I think at least in my definition, what I think neoliberalism is, it doesn't make any sense to apply this, this term to, to Putin. Putin in his early, in his first two presidencies, hires a couple of um, people from this generation as finance ministers, I mentioned Kudrin, but overall, I think the power dynamics is again the same as under Yeltsin. It's, it's Putin who calls the shots and he hires and fires these people as he sees fit. And in, in his latest, in his presidency now and the one before, these people already no longer played an important role or basically no role at all. And most of the neoliberals who are still alive are now in opposition to Putin. And I'll finish on this note. Thanks very much. I was a bit longer than planned. Sorry about that. Well, thank you very much, Tobias. And um, actually, it's good that you were a bit longer than planned because as it turns out, um, we did not circulate your paper. It was kind of lost in transmission between different um, parts of the system. But I don't think it's a problem because your presentation very well um, summarized the arguments of your paper and pre presented a lot of very interesting evidence. Um, so yeah, thanks for a great presentation. And um, I think we can go straight into the discussion for those who are with us for the first time. Our um, procedure is as follows, if you want to ask a question, make a comment or whatever, put a little plus sign in the chat and you will be called up. Um, Tobias, could you um, go stop the screen sharing? Then I just tried. Okay. Um, in the meantime, we can start. And as tradition has it, the first question comes from Anastasia Schacht. 
please. Thank you so much. Could you possibly briefly tell me if you can see me, actually? Because... I, I can't, unfortunately. Oh, that is so I see your video, but I only see the wall. Yes. Oh. Cool. Is it bad enough? Nope. Okay, something happens to my technique. Okay, at least you can hear me. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you, Yanis, because I almost got a heart attack about the missing paper now. Um, but obviously, it's not that bad. Uh, thank you very much for an insightful presentation and a very lovely uh, insight into the politics of economic thinking uh, of the late Soviet Union. In this regard, I would first thank you separately for bringing in at least what it feels to me like this feeling of uh, revising this assumption, which I comprehend from the current ongoing Russian debate on why it is failing ever still, uh, and what was done wrong uh, during the late Soviet time, precisely this lethargy of gerontocratic regime that finds no energy to reform itself and no thought, no economic thought is there any present in the 1970s and 80s. And obviously this was not the case. Um, and I'm really very much thankful uh, to you for this insight. Probably you might briefly comment on that if I got you correctly in this regard. If there is obviously, probably not on the political level, so it does not penetrate so as to decision making, but still there is obviously quite a vibrant discussion on uh, the possible modes of bringing the Soviet Union, Soviet economy out of this stagnation. Uh, what I would love to ask you too is, do these neoliberals or uh, reformatory actually, do they somehow refer to Kasigin's reform of the 1960s? Because this should be the last milestone of, uh, any endeavor in economic reforming of the plan economy in the Soviet Union. And I'm really wondering in how far they reflected upon it. Did they um, abstract themselves from it? Did they reject it? Did they want to build up upon it? And what was their opinion about it? So thank you very much. Looking forward to your answers. Shall I answer right away or do we collect questions? How, how do you do this? Answer right away for now. Yeah. We are we're good for time. <clears throat> so the question on, on Kasigin, do these people refer to the Kasigin reform? The generation that I'm most interested in, this generation of the 1970s, which you can call, if you like, the neoliberals, or which uh, in Russia are usually called the modern year reformatory. Um, no, Kasigin is no longer so interesting for them. Um, this is part of the kinds of uh, reforms idea that they've come to reject in the 1980s. So initially, there, there, is a, there is a debate of getting back to these kind of reforms. Uh, I mentioned the new economic policy of the 20s. This is something discussed in all these reform models from the socialist world, from Hungary to Yugoslavia to China. Um, but they come to reject this, these, these references to inner socialist world reform. This is something that they associate with this Gorbachev generation with the 1960s. And... Um, and they come to reject us and say, no, this, uh, this has been tried. This was not su successful. We need something radically different. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let's continue with uh, our colleague, Eva Maria Muschi. Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, uh, we emailed a while back, so you know I'm interested in very similar uh, things as you are so it's great to to learn a bit more about your project I was um, just curious if um, you could say uh, something whether um, the new international economic order was important to the thinkers that you that you looked at did they um, consider it important at the time was it relevant at all to their thinking I'm just um, wondering about this because to some extent um, in these broader overviews of, neoliber of neoliberalism, as you know, it's sometimes presented as this backlash in part to the NIEO. So I was wondering to what extent you and your colleagues also see that in the, in the sources that you study. Thank you. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, off the top of my head, I would, I would give I would think I, can, I could give the same answer as about the, the Kosygin reforms for these uh, 1970s generation. This is no longer a positive point of reference. And 
and I can't recall reading any any reference any references to the new international economic order and, a, and an active rejection of it. It hasn't appeared in the in the kinds of texts that are read so far. But I mean, you're, you're of course right. In the West, they say that uh, the rise of neoliberal thought in international organizations or this move away from economic power from the United Nations to the institutions like the IMF was a, a conscious reaction to the these ideas of the new international economic order. But I, perhaps this was something that was happening in, in the Soviet Union as well, but I haven't come across this yet. And one reason may be that these were ideas that were discussed in different institutions in the Soviet Union. So the people who dealt with these kind of uh, concepts in the 60s and 70s were not the mathematical economists, but this was uh, mostly at the institutions like uh, IMEMO, so the, the Institute of, uh, of World Economy. And somehow I always find these, these people were not communicating so much, or at least they didn't leave any traces of, uh, of their communication. So uh, unfortunately, I haven't come across any, any reference to the new international economic order yet. Very good, thank you very much. Um, let's continue with uh, Wolfgang Müller, please. Thank you very much uh, for this excellent talk. I have two questions. Uh, the first uh, relates to the issue of price control. Uh, when you referred to it in your presentation, you argued that uh, price control meant political control and therefore was, was uh, any lifting of price control or liberalization was rejected. Uh, I understood this referred to the pre-Gorbachev era. I, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so when we look at the uh, Gorbachev times and uh, the Politburo protocols, we see very much that uh, Gorbachev feared that any lifting of price control uh, would exacerbate uh, the social situation. Uh, so how was the uh, rejection of the lifting of price control argued before Gorbachev? If I understood correctly, you were referring to the pre-Perestroika uh, times. And the second question relates to, again, to something that was touched upon only very briefly, because I think in general, your talk is very convincing and I think it also is very much in line with uh, previous findings by Robert English or by Chris Miller. So I think it dovetails very nicely with what has been analyzed. So my second question refers to your reference to the Chinese model. Again, uh, could you give us some more detail as to how this was brought into the discussion? We know that uh, Gorbachev obviously did not opt for uh, the Chinese model of reforming the economy, but not uh, the political system. He rather put his priorities on the political reform in the end and always uh, shied back from really cutting into uh, the Soviet economic system as regards, for instance, price control, what we talked about before. So could you perhaps clarify a little bit how does this Chinese argument uh, come into your into into your general argument thank you very much for your talk thank you um how is price control linked to political control i think a, an important experience for the soviet leadership is the novo Cherkask uprising in the early 60s when uh, prices were um prices for food stuff um, were adapted closer to their, their, their real value, which meant um, they, there were price hikes and there was an enormous uprising against them. And this was a traumatic experience for the Soviet leadership. And this pops up occasionally then in the discussions. Uh, we cannot allow to um, deregulate prices because uh, in effect, this would mean a price hike for especially basic goods, which were heavily subsidized in, in the Soviet Union. This would create social instability and, and thus threaten our political control. And this is also something that still dominates the discussion in the 1980s under, under Gorbachev. The, the liberals or the, the proto-liberals or neoliberals, all of these are these mathematical economists who, well, they know the math and they know that um, prices are too low and that there is a hidden inflation in the 1980s and there's uh, 
um, a lack of consumer goods because um, because prices are too low and they're always really ready for at least an adaptation of prices and Gorbachev says no we can't do this um, or we can only do this in combination with uh, higher salaries which then equal out the, the price hike so it continues but Gorbachev until the end says um, price liberalization is not something we can do and the moment that he loses power and the the liberals are then um, um, with Yeltsin in power it's the first thing that you the first thing that you um first of January or second of January 1992 is radical price liberalization now um you mentioned English and, and Miller both excellent books I think the problem with English is that he has a very strong westernization narrative so for him everyone who has any kind of reform ideas in the Soviet Union dissidents Gorbachev the economists they're all westernizers and this I find a bit I don't know not it's not the way I would I would see um these people this is sometimes also the way that these people afterwards present themselves someone like Gaidar who says in the 1990s he he was always a closet liberal and also a democrat and so forth maybe but from the evidence from the 70s and, and the 80s you don't really find this I, I don't think it makes sense to think of these people as westerners and then um, and um and Miller has, has an excellent book about, uh, about perestroika as actually an attempt of Chinese reforms in, in the Soviet Union. As it basically says that what Gorbachev tried was the Deng Xiaoping path. He just failed because the bureaucrats were so strong. And this is a much debated argument. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting argument, but it's also the argument that Gorbachev himself always makes. And uh, you can question this, this argument from a number of Angles, perhaps there were also mistakes that Gorbachev made, and perhaps there were differences between the Chinese path and the Gorbachev path. And, uh, and I think the differences were particularly in um, keeping political control, if need be, violently. This is what the Chinese did, and Gorbachev refused to do. But it was also in, in financial austerity. This is something that Gorbachev did not want to implement this is something that he would, did not want to do to the soviet population and the chinese leadership didn't care they did it and they implemented austerity and they made sure um, prices were adapted and they made sure that the bureaucrats were scared to say anything against the central leadership by um, massacring these people on Tiananmen. so you occasionally read that china had um, a gradual path and the soviet union went a underwent a shock therapy, he might as well turn, turn it around and say actually it was China that went through a, a shock therapy with authoritarian leadership and uh, very harsh financial austerity, whereas neither Gorbachev nor later Yeltsin really went all the way, all the way in terms of uh, financial, authority, um, financial austerity and, uh, and really a harsh political uh, dictatorship to implement this. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Um, I put myself next on the list. Um, and yeah, actually my question half connects to something you said before. I mean, one of your arguments, and um, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that, that you make in your paper that um, <clears throat> most people here couldn't read, but so I'm gonna use my privileged knowledge. You argue there, um, and you basically argued it here too, that you don't find evidence for Sort of transmission, trans, transmission, transfer, whatever reception of um, Hayek and other people by those by those Soviet economists, um, and you refer to memoirs as a source. And um, I mean, now you mentioned that Gaidar did not sort of he he presented himself as a as a Westernizer sort of in retrospect. Now, what if those economists? in retrospect, would rather not talk about their neoliberal influences because it's such a it's such a swear word, basically. It's not a good thing anymore if it has ever been sort of for, for many people in, in for the, the perception of many people to be a neoliberal. So what if there is a conscious effort to downplay certain influences? Is that, um, am I onto something or? Um, <laughs> You know, it's always, I mean, it's always hard to, to tell, you know, it's always hard to prove what did not happen, right? As in, okay, you don't find evidence, but 
could you do you find evidence to let, let me phrase it that way this way do you find evidence that there might be a conscious effort to de neoliberalize oneself in the self representation so to speak thank you that's a good question but ask yourself why would they they wanted to be seen as in the 1990s they wanted to be seen as part of this global community of people who stand for a normal economy this is the, the lingo that uh, that they use and they're perfectly happy to interact more pelerin and they they do go to these uh, meetings of cato and this this all is happening this is not something that they are in any way ashamed of no not not, not at all not to this day i mean they are still part of, of these networks my point is just that in the formation of of, of their ideas in the 70s and 80s there was this this, this connection didn't exist and and I don't see a reason for them to to kind of cover up these connections in the 70s and 80s. I, I, I wouldn't see a reason why. My point is kind, is kind of that they developed similar ideas as the neoliberals in the West engaging with this with the same world around them. So they developed similar ideas at the same time because they were reacting to because they were living in the same world, reacting to the same uh, developments in the world economy. And based on these rather similar ideas that they developed more or less independently, they then got together. Um, starting in the late 1980s, and you can you can look at the I mean look if you look at the the Samizdat publications that were published at the time, and also at, starting from 87, I would say they could also publish officially um, during Perestroika in in um, in journals like Novi Mir or Vaprosi Economy, and they do occasionally quote Western literature both in Samizdat and in these discussions, but not the neoliberals. This comes, this starts only in, in 89, 1990. Then they start quoting uh, Hayek and Friedman. Before, if they quote Westerners, it's either this, this literature on um, cybernetics, this is back in, the, back in the 70s. And then and then what they also read from the West a lot is the literature by American Sovietologists. So this is something they're very familiar with and which they all discuss openly, um, but the neoliberals don't appear. And then, the Friedman Hayek type, and this comes very, very late, 89, 1990. Okay, um, thank you for that answer. So let's continue down the list. Now there's uh, more uh, people gathering on the list, but we can still continue with the one by one um, uh, question and answer for now. So next up is our colleague from Red Set, Sheng Peng. Sheng, please. Uh, hello. Well, many thanks for the talk. Uh, actually, myself work on the, the history of Chinese economic reform. I'm wondering if there was any uh, bottom-up approach to economic thinking, for example, any local experiments uh, being picked up by Soviet economists. And, uh, and what was decentralization, for example, uh, uh, any, played any role in economic thinking and reform in Soviet Union? Thank you. And um, you mean ideas that Soviet economists took from China? Or from local provinces? Uh, from local provinces? I don't know. I can. I, I know one example that was actually not only discussed, but also implemented. And this is the idea of free trade, so for special economic zones. This is something that uh, China had been uh, leading in experimenting with uh, since the late 70s, I think, especially around, uh, around Hong Kong. And this is something that uh, the local reformers in the Soviet Union um, um, in the Baltics and in uh, the Leningrad uh, Oblast uh, take from China. And there's a bit of exchange, but this is a small moment uh, in the late 1980s, but it's, but, it's, but it's a role. And overall, I think the discussion on China is more at an intellectual abstract level. So there are not so many things that they actually copy and implement. This is the only example that I, that I can come, come up with or that I know of. Okay. Thank you, very interesting. Okay, thank you. So our next uh, speaker is Janusz Kovacs. Janusz, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias, very much for the very interesting talk. I, I, I basically uh, agree with most of your propositions, except for three things. They are rather essential, so I, 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 will, I will try to make myself clear. The first is, is the proposition of, of a shift, the ideation of shift. 
uh, which means that there are the optimal planners somewhere in the 50s and the 60s, and we arrive somewhere uh, to the to the guidar boys. Now, in 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 my view, I mean there is an ongoing uh, rivalry between the mathematical planners and the institutional reformers, the reform economists. We know a lot of them. I mean, so from Lisichkin to Karagero, don't forget about Lieberman because you never mentioned uh, Lieberman uh, in this uh, in, in this regard. So I mean, the institutional reformers who are not doing mathematical models, who are not doing optimization, and who do not want really to how to say to converse uh, with, with the ruling elite and giving them the, the stone of device in the form of the Optima plan. You get it, you implement it, everything will be fine. You don't need the market. So therefore, my, my, my second uh, observation is uh, that it is very, very difficult, I mean, in my view, uh, to call them neoliberals, I mean, the mathematical planners. So the root of neoliberalism, I mean, this is what this was a proposition risked by, by Johanna Bachmann, and I think it's a very risky, a too risky uh, proposition. Uh, these people, I mean, the, the optimal planners, were not, th were not thinking in terms of, of competition and markets and things like that. They, they were thinking about a kind of rationalization project, a kind of, uh, uh, to use the Hayekian terms, as some kind of constructivist rationalism. And, and then leaving the scene. So they are not, uh, not uh, interested in, in, in institutions. So that is the, the other thing. So I wouldn't think that these people are Hayekians, uh, not even the, uh, the Gaidar boys, but I come back to this. So the first thing is that I guess there is an ongoing rivalry between the institutional reformers and the mathematical planners. So this is not a very simple shift. Uh, the other thing is that these optimal planners were not, uh, how to say, extremely neoliberal. Yes, they were thinking in some kind of marketization, price reform, things like that. Uh, Hosra short, so basically uh, some kind of independent accounting of the of, of the enterprises. But this is, I think, this will be too strong to call them uh, neoliberal. Actually, they were not so much interested in the market. Uh, the, the fact that they were neoclassicals, so neoclassical economies, it doesn't mean that they were neoliberals. Usually this identification is made in the, in the literature. But if you are a neoclassical thinker, you can be a very centralistic, uh, uh, you know, uh, atatist uh, thinker at the same time. Now, finally, uh, the, the, how to say, the, 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 the thesis of some kind of instinctive Hayekianism, uh, I think yes and no. I think you are completely right that they were not reading Hayek. And I, as an eyewitness, I can testify to this in 1988 when, when, when I was rather close to these people like Aven and Chubais and, and Shokin, and I met them sometimes, especially it's quite interesting in Vienna. So they were asking about Hayek. They knew something about Friedman, but they were not reading Hayek at all. At the same time, what they were doing I think it's again a bit of exaggeration to call them instinctive uh, Hayekians. So if you are doing voucher privatization and they were very keen on that, I mean, Hayek would, would be very angry or would have been very, very angry to see uh, a kind of uh, false capitalism, a kind of voucher privatization when you are distributing shares for free and everyone gets it. And then you are starting the competition process anyway. So this is, uh, uh, he would call it again, some kind of rational, I mean, Hayek, a rationalist uh, constructivist project, not at all spontaneous order, not some, not, nothing like that. So I would think twice about calling uh, the mathematical planners uh, neoliberals and calling the Gaidar boys uh, Hayekians. I think uh, you might nuance, I mean, these this terms in order to be a little bit closer to reality. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks very much, Janos. Uh, very interesting comments. I, I also would appreciate a chance if, if at some point we can have a, a longer conversation about this. Um, that, would, that would be great. Um, but let me defend myself a bit here. At least I do think there was an ideation, a shift. And perhaps this can justify this disease of neoliberal as an analytical term. And I think 
it's certainly right what he said about the mathematical planners of the 60s and 70s. They were not neoliberal at all. But there's, there's a shift that happens between these two generations in the 1980s. And I think this generation of, of Gaidar Maishul Koch and so forth, they break with some of the key tenants. They still think mm -hmm. of the economy as, as a self-regulating system and they, they want price deregulation, but they discard this whole um, um, optimization idea. So in mm -hmm. this sense, I think there's, 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 mm -hmm. I do think there's, there's a shift mm -hmm. between these two generations. And, and I try to explain what I mean by the term neoliberal. And I do not mean this in the, in the sense how Joanna Bachmann uses this. So a lot mm -hmm. of the literature that she says neoliberalism is deregulated, unfettered capitalism. Mm -hmm. And no, I, I think this isn't very helpful probably to, to, to define it like this, because then you can simply say unfettered capitalism. But if you think of these, these, these key tenants, this, 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 um, this focus on free prices, price politics, and control society with financial control. I think this is a key tenant of, of the neoliberals, both the central European Hayekian ones, and then also this generation in, mm -hmm. in the 1980s in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And um, in the end, it's, it's, it's a matter of taste, really. So there are pros and cons of, of using this term. Mm -hmm. And clearly, uh, 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 the reason not to do this is because it was usually not used by the actors themselves. Sometimes they use it, but it's rare. Um, and it, of course, creates this confusion but because everyone uses this in a different sense. But then again, if you don't use it, and if you, if you tell the story as a purely very special Soviet has nothing to do with developments elsewhere, you get a kind of a, an isolated story, which I think neglects how much these people were also part of larger shifts mm -hmm. in economic mm -hmm. thinking globally. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, you know, logic of academic discussions you can it's, you can contribute to broader discussions if you say in the soviet union they had a version of neoliberalism let's compare this to forms of neoliberalism elsewhere so pros and cons i'm mm -hmm. actually I'm myself i'm not entirely decided <laughs> um, but uh, i'll keep it in mind i keep thinking about this thank you. thanks very much thank you all right thank you maybe just to throw in here that i mean your definition that you give of neoliberalism is actually very close the way i understand it to joanna bachman she's also very much about strong states and political molding and not about unfettered unfettered capitalism she's actually very much about the state as being important there so i actually see a thing see a lot of overlap there but um be that as it may um i don't want to impose um, this topic here now, because we have someone else on the list, uh, two more people actually for now, and the first of them is Alexei Safronov, please. Uh, yes, thank you, and uh, thank you, Tobias, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the reasons you see uh, why uh, the ideas of uh, this group of uh, so-called uh, Soviet liberals became so influential in the late 80s. Because in the beginning, uh, we are talking about a relatively small group of intellectuals uh, who, is, uh, who are discussing their ideas in a very uh, small circle. But uh, then something happens and uh, their ideas became uh, uh, dominant uh, around the whole uh, uh, talks about the Soviet economy. So uh, how, 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 do you, how do you see why, uh, why this uh, happened? Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. It's an open question that is, that is discussed. So you, you read different views on this. In the Klein Stiglitz kind of uh, stories, uh, they say it was uh, pressure from abroad on the Russian government to hire these people and use their advice. Uh, I don't see much evidence for this. I think it has a lot to do with the with the political power struggle between Gorbachev and Yeltsin in 1990-91. And Gorbachev uh, has a whole set of economic advisors. The first is uh, Bagamolov, the Agandegian generation, then the uh, Petrikov people, and uh, Yavlinsky also in the, uh, in, in, in the final year of, uh, of, of his war. And for Yeltsin, who does everything to outmaneuver Gorbachev in this, in this power struggle, these people who stand for different economic ideas, they're all somehow tainted because of their association with Gorbachev. And he wants a new group of advisors who, are, who had not collaborated with, uh, with Gorbachev. And this is why he, he 
he um, he connects uh, via his advisor Murmulis to this to this group around Gailar. And as I said, they, they were as it was an extremely young group. They were 30, 32, 35 years old. Um, and um, and for Yeltsin, they were probably convenient because they were not um, not too close to these networks of power that he wanted to distance himself from, which he had been part of himself, <laughs> but it's a process of, of, of distancing and establishing his own power. And this is why he eventually decides on the proposals made by this group. This is the best explanation I, I can give. I'm sure there are others, but this is my my knowledge so far. Thank you. Okay, then let's continue with uh, Philip Thier. Philip, please. Oh, uh, thanks a lot. You know, um, having written about neoliberalism, neoliberalism and having tried to define it, um, yes, I totally agree. And I think this discussion has showed it again that it is always needed to distinguish it from uh, neoclassical thought among the economists. That, that, that's clear and very important. Also, it is not easy. Um, but I think in general, it can be done. Uh, concerning Bachmann, yeah, uh, I see some similarities, but anyway, I think there's the, you know, the telos um, in your story is after all probably a different one. And I think this is the way how to distinguish yourself. Um, because obviously, you know, for Bachmann, this is um, all leading up to those horrible reforms. And um, I never understood why in the interviews, uh, there was not a clear picture. Well, we wanted something else. I mean, uh, in her book, that is more variegated, of course, but, but nevertheless, I think there's the problem of the, uh, of the Taylor, which can be avoided. Now, a key issue about defining all this, and maybe also in those reforms, and now I'm coming to my question is, the relationship to the state. Now, of course, there's this increasing tendency in international literature to stress the connection of neoliberals uh, with the state. And yet, uh, yes, they wanted a state. Sometimes this is argued in Foucaultian sense, the, the coercive state. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, because I think there is also um, in the, among the Americans, um, the Chicago boys, Friedman, I think I see a paradox relationship to the state. Maybe that could also be labeled as libertarian or influenced by libertarian thought. And that is that they very basically, they dislike the state. That's why they talk about big government and you know um, um, bureaucratic monsters and so on. Um, now I can understand that you guys, they with their own experience, they might have disliked it as well. Um, and well, of course, then you talk about bureaucracy, right? For good reasons. Um, so a dislike, on the other hand, of course, they know that they need um, a strong state. But what is then their picture of a strong state? Um, and, and I wanted to ask about this possible paradox between dislike, you know, disliking it and yet needing it. Like Friedman needed a central bank, obviously, um, which is a state institution. So are there, where are the tensions in the relationship to the, um, to the state? And my second question is uh, much briefer. Um, well, you, you mentioned um, voucher. And uh, then there was Jeffrey Sachs. They looked at uh, Czechoslovakia, and Václav Klaus. Um, so was there then a closer, uh, you know, closer connection to other countries, other models, trying to implement them? Of course, you know, there's a process of adaptation, but um, that's my second question. You know, for, because you, you more or less portrayed them as a very independent and even maybe isolated or solipsistic group. Um, and then there's this opening um, to trade uh, for migration. Um, and do you see there also an opening to foreign ideas? Is this, I don't want to repeat the Stiglitz argument, right? It's not about <laughs> imposing something. This is, this is what you say if you, were, if you work for the World Bank and you want to attack the IMF. Uh, in 1994-95, forget it. That makes sense. Um, 
but um, inside, you know, um, is there a quest for uh, looking for foreign models to get uh, Russia out of the out of the worst? Thanks, Philip. On the notion of the state amongst neoliberals, I would say neoliberals everywhere are not only neoliberals, but they also stand in local intellectual traditions. So the neoliberals in the United States clearly stand in a tradition of anti-state well, anti skepticism, uh, local libertarian traditions, and this connects. And so, um, Figures like Friedman, I would say, are actually on rather on the margins of neoliberalism, aren't they? I think one reason you can still call him a neoliberalist is, is these monetarist ideas and the the idea of of, uh, of a necessary central bank, which is not very libertarian. So in this sense, he's a, he's a neoliberal. And um, other versions of neoliberalism, the I don't know, Freiburg, auto liberalism, ha they have their own ideas of of, uh, of the state. And I would say, if you want to apply this term to 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 this Russian group. They also have their ideas of the of the state, which stand in local intellectual traditions. And in my paper, I discussed this briefly how they also connect to you know traditional thinking of Russian intelligentsia about the Russian state in a kind of a predicament. On the one hand, they're threatened by the state, but at the same time, they're also afraid of uh, the unruly masses. And you can read this in in the writing. A lot of references back to discussions of the early 20th century and this um, and this idea that actually the bigger threat to the Russian intelligentsia, to the urban intellectuals comes from the ignorant masses and that this is why they should go together with the state as the, the, the lesser evil. So there are these, these local traditions always that, that feed into different local varieties of neoliberalism, if you will. Voucher. Well, you said it yourself, the Stiglitz story is, of course, Voucher privatization it was uh, uh, conjured in, in Harvard, and then these Harvard boys went to Russia and imposed this on, on, uh, on the transforming economy. But if you dig a bit deeper, and if you look at the economic summits that in the Soviet Union, early 1980s, you see that these ideas are already being discussed. And this is um, um, especially a, uh, an economist also from Temi by the name of Vitaly Naishul, and he devises a scheme in 81, I think, uh, on the voucher privatization of the Soviet economy. Um, he, discusses, he discusses this uh, through the 1980s in, the, in, this, in, in this group, and most people are actually quite critical of it, um, probably because they are, as, as, uh, as was said earlier, critical of this kind of uh, popular capitalism idea. Nonetheless, in the 90s, uh, exactly this nice uh, thing is, is, is implemented. Complicated story, but in the end, in the upshot, what is clear is that the idea was already there. This was uh, this was locally created by a mathematical economist, and I tried to find out where Naishul got his ideas from. It's it's not so easy; it doesn't reference anything. And um, the only older version of a voucher privatization that I could find was one of the Canadian Forest uh, um, Administration. So they apparently had some kind of a voucher privatization in the 70s. But I'm not sure. I kind of doubt that Naishu was aware of this. I think, and this was also by his own account, how he tells the story. He says this was his own invention. Okay, um, Janos um, plussed himself in again. So Janos, please. Go for a second. Uh, sorry, I, I really do not want to dominate the discussion, but but you know that that was a very important uh, question which was uh, asked by Alexei about why why did these guys become so important, and I would uh, I would suggest then uh, okay let's let's keep the the shift uh, the shift proposition and let let's put the uh, some kind of a late convergence. I mean, so between the mathematical planners, between the institutional reformers, at the end of the 80s, uh, in the, let's say, in the agonizing phase of the perestroika, and then you will find people there together whom you didn't, uh, whom you hadn't thought to, to, to come so close together. Uh, uh, then you find Gaida, then you find Tatiana Zaslavskaya, it's a very important uh, uh, name here because 
uh, these boys were not called Gaidar boys originally, but Zaslavskaya boys. So they were, they were coming from the sociological tradition and from the late perestroika period. And then you find Shatavin, which is reinforcing your thesis about the mathematical economist. And you find there also Yasin. So there is a kind of convergence between, uh, between these streams, which, uh, which uh, helps you to, to keep the shift thesis and then uh, talking probably about, about convergence. And then it also probably, uh, probably answers the question why they became so important uh, uh, so quickly. So you needed Gaida's position in the Communist, I mean, so in the editorial board, you, you needed Zaslavskaya who had, a, 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 how to say, a daily access to Gorbachev and things like that. So then the convergence uh, would explain probably the, the seriousness or the importance of this group later. Thanks. Yeah, maybe, maybe just a quick reply to this. Uh, Zaslavska is clearly important because she leads these uh, excursions that I mentioned in the, in the Altai. And this yeah. is where um, a lot of these people who then become um, the advisors in the 90s um, made the, had their first encounters with the uh, Soviet economy on the ground. Mm -hmm. But these people were also from Tsini. So these were people mm -hmm. from Moscow, uh, trained in mathematical economics, and then they went to Novosibirsk and to, to the Altai. And so there's also a connection. They all originally come from, uh, from, from Tsini as well. And, and Zaslavskaya, as far as I know, I mean, she's one of these people who is too connected to Gorbachev to be still influential under, under, under Yeltsin. So the, she's among this group who then gets discarded by Yeltsin in favor of this younger group who he sees as detached from, from Gorbachev. Okay, um, given that we have a few more minutes, I also put myself once again here, um, connecting to something you said before about these local contexts, these local intellectual traditions, um, and in this case, the tradition of Russian liberalism. And this is, this is something that um, I would like to hear a bit more about, to what extent, um, like to what extent this played into, into, these, into these ideas, into these concepts of these liberals, because I mean, there was after all this pre-revolutionary tradition, and, and I don't know, there was Stalipin and, and Vite and whatnot. Um, and then, but then of course, like that's the one thing. On the other, on the other hand, there is like this Russian intellectual tradition of looking to the West, right? I mean, this connects to what Philip said before to an extent. I mean, I, I do remember with a certain horror discussions in, in St. Petersburg, intellectuals discuss, discussing whether uh, Peter the Great was good for Russia, was good for Petersburg or not, you know, in, in the 2000s, like as if it had happened yesterday. So. This so there is like also there's there's a local liberal tradition and there's a local tradition, if you will, of emulating the West or of, 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 of having the feeling that you have to emulate the West to get ahead. So to what extent does this um, appear in in those discussions or are those young guns actually perhaps free of all this um, of this baggage? Thank you. No, they're certainly not free of this baggage, but this is uh, analytically tricky. And you find references to pre-1917 liberalism a lot in the memoir literature. So Gaidar presents himself in a tradition with people like Stalupin or, or Witte, and says basically we continue in this, in this tradition of, uh, of Russian liberalism. There's also, at least starting in the late 80s references to discussions or contributions of Russian liberal economists in the 1920s to the socialist calculation debate. And there were Soviet economists who, from, who were liberals at the time before, before they left the Soviet Union. Um, there are these references, but I'm not sure if, if these are actually, if, if these earlier trajectories had an influence on their thinking in the 70s and 80s or whether this, these aren't stories that they came up with afterwards. And this is very difficult to disentangle the stories that they tell about the intellectual roots afterwards and the actual intellectual roots at the time. So I, I, don't, have an, I don't have an answer really, but there are these, clearly there are these, these references. 
but so far I mostly find them uh, ex post and not so much um, at the time. The West, these Malandi um, Reformatory, this this uh, group around Gaida and Chumais, and these people clearly wanted to have what they called a normal economy, and their definition of a normal economy was this of a Western economy. They wanted to have a capitalism of the Western type. They wanted um, the living standard of the West for, for Russia. So clearly the West was the goal. But a lot of these discussions are not about the goal. This is something that most of them can agree on. The, the question is how, how does Russia get there? And in terms of transitional models, there's just not so much inspiration that they can take from the West. I think this is also a reason why Hayek and Friedman are not so relevant for these people because they don't write about how to turn a planned economy into a, into a capitalist economy. This is uh, something that the West cannot tell them much about because it was a long, uh, century long process in the West. And I think this is a reason why there's, there's, there's this interest in these third world transition and models because yeah because they were transition and models and this is something they could only learn from non-western countries not from the west hey this, this is very interesting this distinction between the goal the telos if you will and the way there um since you mentioned the transitional model but the, like transition is the terminology they chose i mean this is um this is, I mean, part, part of what we're discussing here right now, when we talk about transformation as opposed to transition with this teleological implication of, of, you know, being in a transitional phase from A to B and B is clearly defined. So was transition, was that, was that source terminology or not so much? No, I never come across either transformation or transition, no. If there's a, a representative uh, formulation, then it is the creation of a normal economic system. Okay, which is and even very more... often, very often in combination with all world experience shows that this is how you get to a normal economy. <laughs> uh -huh. That's uh, yeah, that's even more normative, of course, a normal system. But uh, okay, very interesting. Um, well, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to weigh in here at this point? If not, then, um, well, thank you very much to BS for the presentation. Thank you everybody for participate, for listening, for participating in the discussion. Um, as was mentioned in the chat before, the paper will now be circulated ex post as well to um, give you a chance to read up on this, um, if you wish, there will also be a recording of the session on our YouTube channel, which um, can highly recommend. Um, and uh, there will also be a podcast with Tobias, um, which will be published at a later stage as part of our transformative podcast series, which um, you can find on all the important um, podcast portals. So um, just a small um, commercial block here. Um, thank you very much. Um, well, this is, as far as the seminar is concerned, the end of the semester. So um, to those whom I will not see again um, before the next semester, wish you a good summer. Um, for everyone who will participate in Monday's Your Fix, which is an internal event, um, see you on Monday. And um, have a good weekend once it gets there. So thanks everyone. And bye bye. Thanks very much.